Hello, everybody. My name is Jack Jablonski, and I am a member of the AI success team working out of our Chicago office. In today's learning session, we are going to talk about how to effectively work with small data sets. As a global coronavirus pandemic is causing major disruptions to communities and the economy, many existing data science models struggle to adapt to these shifts due to the shortage of available data. Today's presenters are Rajiv Shah. He is a data scientist at Data Robot, where he, his focus is primarily to help customers improve their ability to make and implement predictions. Previously, Rajiv has been part of a data science team at Caterpillar and State Farm. He has worked on a variety of projects from a wide ranging set of areas, including supply chain, sensor data, actuarial ratings, and security projects. He has a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We also have Dave Henneke. He is a customer facing data scientist at DataRobot focused on customer success with the platform. With a degree in mechanical engineering from Dartmouth, Dave has focused on energy industry prior to DataRobot. Dave also works closely with customers in the oil and gas industry, manufacturing, logistics, and more to ensure they derive value from their data. Also, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end, so please save your questions and you can also add them to the question box during the session. We'll go through those as well. As a reminder, all of these are recorded and available on the community website. And if you have additional questions, you can email them at aisuccess-webinars at datarobot.com. Now I'll hand it over to Rajiv. Hey, thanks so much, Jack. I appreciate all of you taking the time to spend some time learning about working with small data sets today. Um, for those of you that are going to trying to make the most of this crazy time, one thing we're doing is within Data Robot, we have the community area, the learning center there. We have a team of data scientists now working to build out content around that. So please take advantage of all of that. Also, if you're doing research around COVID, we've made a trial offering of our platform available. If you visit our website, you'll be able to see that. And that allows anybody to get hands on with Data Robot. The last thing I want to emphasize before kind of Dave takes over is the approach that we're going to take here in this webinar, but a bunch of these webinars, it's a really a practical data science approach. So we're not going to emphasize lines of code when we're doing this, but instead the core concepts around data science and how we use these as building blocks to help us explore and search the best possible solutions for these problems in a very rigorous way. And you'll see that come to light as we go through this. All right, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dave. Thanks. All right, thanks, Raj. Yeah, so I think today um, what we want to do is focus on modeling issues around small data sets, so data sets where you have limited data to work with. Um, kind of want to go to where some of the underlying issues come from, how that can impact the type of model fit that you're going to get, and then some techniques for working with smaller data sets to kind of dodge some of those common problems that might arise. So where does this really come from? You know, in machine learning, we hear lots and lots about big data. People have gathered terabytes of data from you know, their customers, from web traffic, from sensors, and so on. But what I want to focus on today is kind of the other end of the spectrum, the really small data sets. So we're not working with terabytes or gigabytes here. In fact, in this case, we might only be working with a few hundred rows of data. When we're working with large data sets, we have plenty of examples to validate or test our model on, and we can control for overfitting relatively easily. But challenges with big data are often engineering challenges. So you know, how do you fit this model that you use for training into memory? And how do you account for model latency when scoring large amounts of data? But when we're working with small data sets, the challenge becomes less about engineering and more about the nuances of machine learning. So how is this particular model picking up on signal? Which features is it using? And how exactly are we validating the model fit? So to jump into a really common example, think about a use case where we're working with clinical trial data. We may only have a few patients involved in the study, and we have quite about a bit of information that we've gathered about them. So we're going to have a lot of predictors to work with, a lot of detail in the patient's medical record. In fact, we might even be working with genomic data, in which case we'd have thousands of predictors that could be involved with our target outcome. But it's really difficult to figure out which factors reliably predict your target outcome when you only have a few hundred examples to work with. Now, you can't just dismiss the model issues and say, well, go gather more data. 
because the patient population is what it is. So in these cases, we have to be extremely careful that the predictors our model thinks are associated with an outcome are real predictors and not associated with our target just due to chance. But think about another use case. So maybe we have a long history of training data to work with. We might have years and years of training data, but the system that we're modeling has gone through some sudden, dramatic, and unexpected change, meaning a lot of our past examples that we're using to train our model may not really be relevant to the, pres to the present. So in this example, we could potentially use some of our historic examples to inform our model, but we have to be extremely careful because we only have a few recent examples following the sudden change that we can use to validate this particular model approach. But this is a really common situation a lot of folks find themselves in after the COVID-19 outbreak. Data scientists everywhere are grappling with this problem. Suddenly, my years of training data that I've gathered may not inform a useful model in the present. And folks are scrambling to develop and validate an understanding of what's going on right now. So, those are some examples where you're going to run into modeling with small data sets. What I do is kind of get into some of the underlying problems that, that cause issues when modeling with small data sets. So as a quick recap, let's, let's touch on what overfitting is. In machine learning, what we're trying to do is find a balance between a model that's too general, that doesn't really provide any useful understanding of the underlying system, versus a model that's too specific. So on the left, our model doesn't really capture the signal in the data. But in the far right, that model is too specific to the training data. It's learned every point really well, but if we were to add another point and have it make a prediction on it, there's a good chance this model is gonna fall apart and not do a particularly good job uh, creating a prediction. And this is a real kind of more extreme issue when we're dealing with very small data sets because it's harder to know whether we're overfit or not. So, and it's very, yeah, I'll go keep going, Dave. I'll, I'll jump in after this one. Okay. Yeah, so, so here's, here's an example. Imagine we have to build a, a model to classify red versus green. What we want is a model of what that decision boundary looks like. Now, there's always gonna be multiple models that are gonna fit our training data, but with a larger data set, like the one that we have on the left, the models are more likely to fit a similar and consistent pattern. However, as the number of training examples shrink, the models that fit our training data are gonna vary more and more, and we're less and less confident that a particular pattern or model that we found is actually gonna extrapolate well to future data points. And I just wanted to chime in, right? The overfitting is such a problem when people have small data sets, and especially if you have data scientists that are very familiar with machine learning, but not so much working with small data sets, they're not aware of kind of all the tips and techniques, and if you just do a little bit of feature selection before you split your data set, there's so many ways to cause leakage there that I see it all the time, um, this problem of overfitting with it. Now, go ahead. Yeah, so it can really, it can come up in, in multiple different ways, regression, classification, time series. It, it comes up in a lot of different use cases. Now, another issue is the impact of outliers. Now, even with a larger data set, models can be negatively impacted by a highly unusual or outlier example in the training data. But when we have fewer training examples or a smaller data set, the impact of an outlier reading can be magnified. It could potentially have a much greater negative impact on the model fit. So if you think about our two examples, on the left column, we've got models built with larger data sets, and the right column, we've got models built with a smaller data set. Um, the ones at the bottom, in red, both have an outlier. You can see the outlier just doesn't have as much an effect when we have more training examples. But if we only have a few, an outlier can really throw the model off. So another issue that's really particular to smaller data sets is the issue of the unlucky validation fold, where a single large outlier could potentially land in just one of the training or validation folds, making the model appear to unexpectedly fall apart when it's exposed to one of the folds that does not contain the outlier. So, we really have to be, take extra care to identify outliers prior to modeling with smaller data sets and determine whether an unusual example really should be kept in our training data or potentially removed. So we know there's an issue here, but the question that kind of naturally arises, well, well how many rows are enough for a given problem? Like, how do I know that I have enough data to build a reliable model? 
It, and the answer there is that it depends, of course, right? It, it really depends on the underlying variance in the data that you're building a model of. But a couple things you can do just to get a sense for whether your model is going to be reliable is look at the out of sample error. So as a quick check, if you look at Data Robots leaderboard, you can compare the errors in the validation, cross validation, and holdout set just to see if they're consistent. If one of them is much greater than the other, that tells you that you may have an issue with overfitting. Another thing you can do if you want to get a little more granular is to look at the individual errors within the individual cross-validation folds. So as a quick recap of cross-validation, what we're essentially doing is slicing up our training data into multiple columns or folds, training on all of those folds except one, and then validating our model on the one fold that we didn't train on. But then what we do is we repeat that process, except we pick a different fold to be our holdout or validation fold. We repeat this over and over again. And what that does is it gives us repeated examples of out of sample validation, just to check our model multiple times to see whether it's generalizing well to data it's never seen before. So by repeating this process of refitting and scoring the model over and over again, we have more opportunities to verify that our model is going to generalize well to unseen samples. Now, there's another hint in, in the learning curves. So if you want to answer the question, do I have enough training data? We'd also recommend taking a look at the learning curve. So as a quick recap, what's the learning curve? Here, what we're doing is plotting the model error for multiple models as the number of training samples increases. So the x-axis is the amount of training data, and the y-axis is the out of sample model error. What you'd expect is as you add more training data, generally your out of sample error is gonna get better. Your model has more examples to learn on, learn from, and it's a better model. So what you're gonna look for is some kind of consistent behavior. Is the out of sample error getting better as I add more data, or is there a lot of noise that's potentially throwing it off? The other thing we wanna look for it's kind of the, whether the learning curves themselves are starting to level out. Early on, you'd expect your learning curve to be really steep. Every bit more data that you're giving the model to train on really improves the model performance. But after a while, you kind of reach ground truth, and the model performance is going to start to level out as you, as you get more data. If you see kind of a nice, smooth curve like this, that's a usually a good sign that you may have enough training data to get a reliable model. On the other hand, hand can I jump in there real quick? Yeah, absolutely. And I think learning curves are super powerful for, yes, we're talking about small data, but they also help us on the other end when you have large data sets, right? So when I have the IT person come in that insists that you have to build a model on four terabytes of data, using the learning curves is helpful to kind of show them that, no, you don't need to build it on four terabytes, that all that information is redundant, and we can actually use just a small set of the data and get a model that's just as good. Um, and this is a this is a classic thing for those of you who took Andrew Ng's uh, machine learning course. He talks about learning curves there. So this isn't kind of some proprietary secret. It's just kind of good data science. All right, keep going, Dave. Yeah, this is always a good. I mean, any modeling project, big data, small data, it's always a good idea to check your learning curves. So with the smaller data set, sometimes the learning curves go horribly wrong. So something clearly is going wrong here. A couple of things we're noticing. One, we have fewer samples. So some of these curves are really steep, meaning that even adding a few more rows is substantially improving the out of sample model error, implying that the model still has quite a bit more information it can gain from more examples. So that's kind of one red flag. But the other red flag here is a sudden increase in out of sample error as some models are given more training data. Now that's counterintuitive, but what it's telling you is that your model probably overfit to something in its training example. And it's just another red flag that, you know, you may not have enough training data to build a reliable model, or some models are too complicated and they're overfitting to your training data to be used reliably. So those are just some ways to check as to whether you've got enough data to train with. Um, of course, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, oftentimes your data set is what it is. You can't go gather more data. So what are some things you can do to kind of mitigate these problems? Well, generally, to reduce the risk of overfitting with small data sets, 
a really common practice is to start with a simpler model. Fortunately, DataRobot does a lot of that model selection for you. Since it's ranking models on the leaderboard by their out-of-sample performance, a model that does better, like a, a simpler model that's less likely to overfit, is likely to float to the top. If you end up doing a lot of modeling with smaller data sets, you'll notice that there's kind of a lot of usual suspects that tend to float to the top with these types of data sets. Models like the Elastic Net Classifier, SVMs, or Eureka. To get some kind of intuition for why these types of models tend to do well, regularized linear models, for example, they tend to work well because they are both relatively simple, but they also do a good job at feature selection. So if they have a lot of columns to work with, they do a pretty good job of removing the columns that carry very little signal. They have is a regularization term that forces the model to use fewer columns and potentially rely less on spurious correlations. You'll also notice the models um, called support vector machines often tend to do well in smaller data sets. Turns out they tend to do well from more or less the same reasons that linear models do well. And so Dave, I think you know this is an important piece is just as why we want to be able to use things like auto ML where we can try lots of different techniques because again, you never know what's gonna ha what's gonna work best. This is the no free lunch theorem part of data science. And I think one of the things both of us have learned um, is how some how well some of these algorithms actually work consistently on these small data sets. Um, but you only get this feedback if you try all these different approaches. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because a good rule of thumb is that linear models are simpler and, and do better, but it's interesting every now and then you will have a gradient boosted tree algorithm, which you might think would overfit, actually still does pretty well on a smaller data set. So, you know, it's not always immediately obvious that this type of model is going to do the best. That's a really good point. You still want to try and, different approaches. And I think because part of it is, is it's not only the number of rows in the data sets, it's kind of the information density in a data set. Because sometimes you can have um, a small data set and it's still very simple to be able to tell the difference between, let's say, two classes. But in another data set, it might be much more noisy. It might be much harder to be able to tell the difference kind of between the two. And so that's another kind of variable that also comes into play when we start thinking about what approaches work best on these data sets. And I think that's why sometimes we see different algorithms. I see, you know, random forest, for example, working well sometimes with noisy data. All right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. So one other model that I want to highlight that tends to show up in that kind of usual suspect group that does surprisingly well on, on really small data sets is a model called Eureka. So a little bit of history. These models were added to the leaderboard after DataRobot acquired a company called Newtonian a few years ago. And they're one of the few like non-open source algorithms in the platform. The way they work is they fit an analytic expression to the training data using a genetic algorithm to combine mathematical building blocks until it finds a formula that fits the data well. Their expressions returned are limited by their complexity though. So what it does is it penalizes complicated and potentially overfit models. So going through this process of trying millions of combinations of features and different formulas while penalizing the complexity of those formulas, the algorithm is very effective at generating a robust model, even though it has a really small number of training examples. So because these Eureka models are robust, even with a limited number of training examples, Eureka has been used really widely in academic research. So it's oftentimes in real world science, like we just have a limited number of results to learn from, from our experiments. So in this example, we have researchers who were tasked with predicting post-concussive symptoms following traumatic brain injury, using a sample of only 20 patients and 16 controls. Even though they only had 36 data points to work with, they're still able to find useful analytic relationships shown in the lower right. So those are kind of the types of models. Uh, hey Dave, let's talk a little bit more about Eureka because I think it also touches upon an important point when we're modeling because a lot of us come from um, or, or have started now as this kind of paradigm shift to machine learning of starting and trying to find signal just from the data itself. And there's a lot of old school people as well as kind of engineers. Me as an academic was kind of raised thinking, you need to think about the theory, about how these variables interact before you start the modeling. And I think this is often more true, especially with physical systems, 
as well as kind of some of the small data sets where you can get a, a, a much better model in the long run if you have an understanding of the system. And so this is both kind of a eureka point and a non-eureka point, but from a eureka point, it helps you sometimes gain an understanding of the physical dynamics. But also, even if you have only a partial understanding of a system and whether or not you use eureka or not, sometimes taking those insights and adding them as features to a machine learning model helps when you're working with kind of small data sets. So um, I think understanding the theory and the, what's going on behind something is just as important, kind of even more important when you're working with small data sets. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I would just to think of a story. I've actually worked with a customer on this. They were, were building a model to understand corrosion rates under different conditions. And you know, it's like the exact kind of example where, well, corrosion rates are understood. There's been a lot of research done around it over the years. Um, so we kind of have an understanding of what the underlying relationship is. But what you still want to do is use machine learning to correct some of those kind of existing physical models that are out there to account for things where we don't really have a physical model to understand them. And so you can kind of correct the, the physical model that it has been found after years of research using an algorithm like Eureka. Yeah. I mean, it's a, the classic example I think of is in with Eureka, we have the double pendulum example where the SBM does the best because it's probably taking into account friction that the classic model doesn't take into account. So, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, beyond just the models themselves, there's other things you can do to kind of check and make sure that the model fit you've got is a good one. So earlier, we mentioned the technique of cross-validation. Validating the model gives repeated examples of training and predicting on out-of-sample data. Well, this process of cross-validation can be scaled up and repeated with more and more cross-validation folds to improve confidence in the model's fit. Generally, DataRobot's going to default to five-fold cross-validation, but we can increase this if we need. Now, the reason we might want to do this is kind of shown in these two plots. In the example on the left, there are enough data points that increasing the number of cross-validation folds does not have a huge impact on the model fit. But with a much smaller data set, so the one on the right that only contains 40 points, is actually a substantial improvement from using more than five cross-validation folds. So if you're going to do this in the application itself, let me jump over to the UI. So before I start a project, before I hit the Start button, what I can do is go down to Advanced Options, and then under Partitioning, select the number of cross-validation folds. With the smaller data set, it's generally a good idea to maybe increase this. Depends on how many rows of data you have, but the more cross-validation folds you have can just give you more out-of-sample examples to work with and make sure that your model has a good fit. Now, another technique you can use is a technique called nested cross-validation. It's essentially a technique to protect against overfitting. What it does is it uses a series of train validation and test splits within each fold, what you can think of as an inner and then an outer loop. So in the inner loop, the score is approximately maximized by fitting a model to each training set, and then directly maximized by selecting the hyperparameters over the validation set. And then in the outer loop, the generalization error is estimated by averaging test scores over the different cross-validation folds. Now, I know this sounds really difficult to do in practice, but just know that DataRobot's actually doing this for you when it's tuning its model hyperparameters. So you don't have to worry about coding this up by hand. Yeah, it's it's a great question if you really want to like test out the coding dating science ability of somebody to ask them to build out a nested CV. It's it's very hard to do. And this is, you know, these these are the kind of things which cause leakage all the time when people don't do things like nested CV and when you add ensembles or blenders on top of that, it just gets really crazy. Um, and this is why the folks that have been in Kaggle competitions for a long time are really good at this because understanding how to solve these like slight leakage problems really comes into play for those. Thanks. Yeah. Another almost kind of easier way of doing this is to rerun the autopilot with different random seeds. So what that means is the random seed is the random number used to randomly shuffle your training data into different cross-validation and holdout folds. If you have a small number of examples, what you might want to do is rerun the whole project, but with a different random seed and a different shuffling of the data. 
this does is it lets you check the variation in the out of sample scores, the variation in the model that wins, and other things like the variation in the model insights. You know, is there a lot of variation between which uh, feature makes it the top of the feature impact score? Let's give you insight as to whether your model is overfitting to a few examples depending on how the data was shuffled in training. To set this up, again, before you hit start, if you scroll down to advanced options, this time go over to additional. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you'll see the ability to set your own random seed. Now, in practice, when you're doing this, you may be wanting to run a project many times over and over again. And so we recommend potentially using the modeling API to loop through a series of projects with different random seeds. Now, there are some examples where even these, these common techniques aren't necessarily going to solve the issues you're going to have with overfitting. So what happens when you have a really, really wide but short data set where the number of columns is far greater than the number of rows? So an extreme example I mentioned earlier is the example of using genomic data on a small patient population. You may have thousands and thousands of predictors or columns in your data set, but maybe only a few hundred points or rows to train on. Here, the risk of fitting to noise is so great that some type of feature selection prior to doing the actual modeling may be needed. So generally what we'd recommend is apply the domain knowledge to remove irrelevant columns and identify no natural groupings that exist. Another thing you might try is reshuffling the cost validation folds a large number of times to identify features that only correlate to the target due to chance. And then also looking at the feature impact and seeing whether you can get any consistent scores with your feature impact score, or whether you still need to do more feature elimination prior to modeling. And so this is often where it gets really hairy. It's when you're talking about doing feature selection with these wide data sets, because especially if you do feature selection, if you start doing things like looking at the linear relationships, like what, what features are correlated to my target, because maybe I'm going to use that to go from 10,000 to 1,000. Well, if you do that across your entire data set, before you start modeling, that's, that's going to cause a little bit of leakage. So again, it, it's you have to be very careful when you kind of start doing and using these techniques. But often doing that feature selection is important to kind of get the best model. I like, if it's a small enough data set and I can rerun it many times, I like that approach a lot, Dave. Yeah. Again, great opportunity to use the modeling API. So you don't have to worry about clicking through the GUI over and over again. It's good practice just to kind of and Use data anyone, oh, oh, right. I was going to just remind people, if you have questions, feel free to start adding those in as we get kind of closer to um, question time here. Thanks. All right, keep going, Dave. All right. So one last topic I kind of want to talk, touch on is, is the topic of data augmentation. So in some modeling work, such as image classification work, think I want to build a model that predicts whether this is a cat or a dog. Data augmentation can work to create more artificial examples for the model to generalize from. So with image work, you can crop or rotate the images to improve the model fit from only a limited number of training examples. But I just want to make it clear that this technique is really risky with many machine learning problems, especially when you're working with tabular data. For one, it can be tempting to duplicate rows if you cannot kick off a project because data robot saying it doesn't have enough model rows to train from. The reason is that if a duplicated row occurs in multiple cross-validation folds, the error metric could be meaningless. Now, even if you are careful to keep duplicate rows in separate cross-validation folds, this can still lead to an overconfident model. Another approach is creating synthetic data. So there's a few different techniques out there, but generally what you're doing is you're creating more data that is similar to the existing underlying data. But this is risky because it's unclear if the new data added is actually representative of the data set that you're trying to model. This is a really strong assumption, and it can lead to an overconfident model. So uh, I think in the interest of time, I think we want to go ahead and jump over to questions and answers that we may have, may have gotten. All right. Yes, Dave. Um, thanks. So I want to talk more about this moat thing and stuff like that. Um, 
Any tips or techniques for unbalanced data sets was one of the questions. Yeah, so you know, a common question that comes up is, is I have a really, really imbalanced data set and they only have a few examples of my positive class. So think about an example like credit card fraud where the vast majority of transactions are fine. There's no suspected fraud. You only have a few examples of fraudulent transactions. It can be tempting to upsample that negative class so that your model can has more balanced data to train on. But actually, we don't recommend doing that. And the reason is using uh, error metrics like log loss aren't really looking at the accuracy of the model. What they're looking at is how confident the model is. So even with a really imbalanced data set, because the model is penalizing um, confidence in a wrong prediction, it'll still do a really good job um, modeling an imbalanced data set. So generally, our advice is leave it as it is. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have a question for Raj. Um, any suggestions for different metrics we use? We should use okay, actually? Okay, great question. Yeah, great question. Now, one thing I want to highlight, though, is the time went really fast. Dave and I have a ton more material, so we'll try to find another way, another time to kind of get some of this out there. Please feel free to kind of either send questions or comments. Let us know if these kinds of um, series are helpful to you, what else you want. We have the forum on community to do, so lots of ways to kind of reach out to us. Okay, so the question was around different metrics. And this is this comes into play. I think one of the things that really comes into play, for example, is one of the examples where Dave was talking about outliers. So we know some metrics, for example, the difference between RMSE, root mean squared error, versus using mean average error, where RMSE, if you have a couple of those outliers, the RMSE is really going to get thrown off by that. So this is one where you can kind of play around with the metrics. And again, it depends on kind of what your goal is when you're starting to play around with metrics because the metrics control the error, control how accurate your model is, and it kind of shapes, it, and it's, you have to understand your underlying problem and what you're trying to get out of it once you start getting into kind of playing with metrics. But absolutely, it's a fair way to kind of sometimes attack a problem. Thanks, Raj. Um... One, I'll start going through some other questions, but one question right off the top, uh, will we be sending out the slides following the webinar? Fortunately, we're not doing that right now. Uh, currently, you can access that on the Data Robot Community website, and I'll cover that after we close out the questions and answers. Uh, we're potentially looking to share that content in the future, but not for the time being. Uh, Raj or Dave, why does accuracy decrease as um, the number increases, or the N increases, sorry. Yeah, so I, I think that's a question referring to kind of those unexpected learning curves where we actually added more samples and our out of sample error got worse, which is completely counterintuitive. What, if you look closely, that's actually not true for all of the models on there. Some models got better, whereas others got worse. And so what's that telling you is that in the new samples that were added, the more complicated models likely overfit to some of those new samples that were added. And it turns out, just due to unlucky partitioning, you created a model that was actually worse. Now, it's not that that's kind of the end all. If we were to reshuffle our training data again, we might get different behavior in the learning curves. Really, all it's telling us is there's still a lot of variance in the underlying data that we're modeling that our models haven't picked up on. And so it's just a red flag that we may not have enough training data to build a consistent model. Hey, hey Dave, would it be okay to sh shift to the browser real quick? Because I just want to highlight one of the things that's kind of related to that. Is when we look at the, so what I always have that my customers do is just look at the performance across the top of the, 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 the actually, can you show the browser actually the in, in the app? Is look across the performance. Oh, <laughs> I thought you had a model up, sorry. Um, look at the performance across the validation cross validation and the holdout and if you see that inconsistency if you see lots of different numbers kind of changing there that's your first kind of indication that wait a minute something is going on where maybe your data set is really noisy and that's when i encourage kind of rerunning that with a different partition to see that so i'll go back to no go back to um validation scores 
Okay, it's all right. I just wanted to show the difference between the validation and the cross validation and the holdout and just how I scan that. Oh, oh just leave it. Yeah. And so I just scan across here. And when you see kind of big differences between that, that's an indication that, wait a minute, hey, my model isn't holding up consistently and maybe there's some problems. And that's when I like to rerun it with a different seed and see, hey, what happens when I just move around the data? Does the model performance still hold up or is it changing quite a bit? Because if it's changing quite a bit, that gives me an immediate idea that I've not been able to learn a very good signal out of the models. Yeah, I was actually just working with a customer who was working with um, HR data. And they're trying to predict whether uh, some of their employees were going to leave, predicting employee churn. And you know, it's a classic example of a very small training data, training data set with, that's really noisy because you know employee behavior is really kind of inherently noisy problem. And we found that you know some of the best models um, were using random cross validate or sorry random partitioning, and they're getting really good validation scores, but then it would fall apart in the cross validation holdout. And what we decided was, unless we have a model that's consistent across all three, we really can't trust it. And so we had to switch our, validate, our partitioning scheme until we were able to get consistent values. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, next question I have is, how can we tackle this problem in time series projects? We might only be able to validate, not train, on the last dates, when in fact we are mostly interested on the model that best captures that last period? This is a COVID-19 related question. Hey, Dave, you want to start on that one? Yeah, so I think if we got time, what we might do is kind of touch on this topic just really briefly. And it's the idea of, of what do you do with what we call a cold start? Um, so in time series forecasting, you're taking a history and using that history to make a forecast out into uh, the future. So some number of time steps out into the future. And the question is, what do you do when you have a series that doesn't have a history? Or put another way, what if there's a sudden recent shock that effectively means your past history isn't really relevant anymore? Now, we can go into a little bit more detail on this in a later webinar, but just to kind of touch on it really, really briefly, we kind of suggest doing a few things. One, look at your series closely and determine whether it's a true cold start, or whether it's something we can consider more of a warm start, or even though there was a sudden change from COVID, you could still treat it as an ongoing series and your past training examples are in fact still relevant. If you have a warm start, meaning that you have some training history, what you can do is build a time series model with a really short feature derivation window and potentially shorten up your time step. So maybe you're working at a weekly time step, what you could do is switch temporarily to a daily time step, make it a noisier model, but at least you'll have enough rows to kind of build out a model from. Then in the future, when you have enough training examples, you can um, switch back to your preferred time step, maybe your weekly granularity and go from there. Now with the true cold start, it gets a little bit trickier because then you don't have any training data to work with or any real history. So what you could do is build a ordinary regression model with similar examples and just use out of time validation. So check to see if a regression model rather than a true time series model can still make reliable predictions on the most recent examples you have post COVID. In hey, this case, this is just a temporary example. Once you have enough training data, you can start rebuilding a time series forecast model. I was also gonna mention the earlier series that I did with Jay went over some high level practical strategies that you can use. And then we're running a webinar next week um, with Peter Simon, one of our data scientists out of the UK who, who specializes in financial areas. And he's gonna go through some very practical examples of how folks are rebuilding models to deal with all the change that's going on. And so that'll be another kind of, I'll be involved a very another hands-on data science-y um, rich one that we'll go through that in detail. Thanks Raj. So I'll look to alternate the questions. So next one Raj, with the small data set, how do you ensure that your holdout is representative? So the typical technique, right, is just your, that your holdout is representative is that you would kind of sample out from that, um, 
and I'm trying to think if there's other ways. Sometimes if typically you would just, I think that the random sample works for me, unless there's some type of time that you'd want to take into account where instead it seems to make sense to save the most recent data as your holdout. Um, it's like that. I'm kind of curious what the what the questionnaire is getting at um, there. Yeah, so a lot of times when I'm thinking about, well, what should my holdout be? Um, the first thing I ask customers, well, kind of intuitively, just given what you know about the system you're modeling, do you expect that things have been changing over time? Because then you're really gonna wanna make sure that your holdout comes from most recent events. But if it's something where we haven't really expected a lot of change in time, what you might wanna do is just reshuffle your holdout. And instead of relying on one holdout that's representative, you might just try multiple different subsets that could be treated as the holdout, just to make sure after repeated tests um, that your model holds up on unseen data. And so uh, sometimes how I like to think about it is also you want that holdout to be something that you wanna to generalize to. So something that your model hasn't seen before. So if you're working with oil rigs, for example, you can have your holdout be an oil rig that your model hasn't seen before at all, or a new engine or a machine that your model hasn't seen at all. And especially if it's something that's kind of out of time and out of place, difference from your training data, that gives you a bit more confidence that your model actually has found the actual underlying information and that it will generalize. All right. Thanks, Raj. Uh, next question to Dave. How would what you've discussed today related to have instead of a small overall data set, you have a small number of cases that are having the target being predicted? Um, so I'm trying to kind of understand the motivation of the question. So if you had a, a smaller number of actual labeled target examples, is that I think what we're trying to get at? Yep, that, that's what it um, sounds like. Yeah, so this has become kind of a question of like, can you really take a supervised approach or are we kind of stuck with potentially unsupervised approaches where insights like, you know, is a particular example anomalous really most of what we have to work on? Um, I would be hesitant to kind of invent targets. So, so one approach that sometimes folks will use is that they'll use unsupervised techniques like clustering to create a target when they don't have labeled data, and then try to use that to inform the model. And that's always really risky because it's kind of a synthetic target. And you're not necessarily, it's not clear that that synthetic target you've created is actually useful to anything in the real world. But generally, if you don't have a lot of labeled targets, you've got to be really cautious in using you know, machine learning. You may, you may just want to stick to something like kind of common sense business rules, and maybe just machine learning isn't really the right right tool to use. Yeah, this is where the cut and paste kind of data science really goes bad. Is I know there's a ton of blog posts out there on synthetic data and using SMODE, and people cut and paste and kind of use that stuff all the time. And half the blog posts are full of leakage in those examples um, where, where they, you know, where they don't kind of apply test train splits before they do this work. And talking to practicing data scientists, I always ask them about, you know, has for your particular problem using a technique where you've generated synthetic data, and I'm talking here tabular data, numerical kind of machines, that, that kind of information. Augmentation for images is a whole different ballpark. There it works really well. But just generating synthetic data for a lot of smaller data sets is just leads to kind of overfitting. And one of the things is overfitting makes data scientists feel generally good because you think that your model works really well. But the problem is, is when you actually go and take that model and put it out in the field, it falls down and everybody else gets upset. Um, so that's that's kind of the danger of um, with overfitting. I'll go ahead. That's one of the things you gotta fight. You always want you know the best score, kind of like you're in a Kaggle competition, but really sometimes a, a worse score, but a consistent score is more of a win. Yes, that's a good point. Thanks, Rajiv. So just to go to a previous question, I had some clarification. So the question was, with a small data set, how do you ensure that your holdout is representative? And um, 
that particular person says, well, it was mentioned that outliers would significantly affect training data. Same would be true of the holdout. Does that change your answer? So, so this is where the technique that I like to use is to, um, to rerun with multiple partitions where you're moving that one, maybe that one outlier is really bad, but if we rebuild the model a couple of different times, where we've let that one row kind of move around, then we can kind of see the overall average effect of that. And we're not just stuck with it in one partition with one model. So this is again, where kind of that suggestion Dave had of rebuilding it by changing the seed often works really well, helps you identify if you just have that one kind of bad piece. The next question is, is when you have that really one bad outlier, what do you do, right? Do you remove that row? Do you not remove that row? Um, and there, it, the answer can go either way depending on kind of the underlying problem. Yeah, I mean, if I if I've got an outlier in my data, I mean, one question I want to ask is, let's let's be clear about our definition of outlier, because sure, it's different than the other ones, but is it something that we expect is going to happen again, or is it something that was just such a weird one-off event, or potentially just an error that we can safely remove it? If it's something that might happen again, then you may not really want to remove that outlier. Sure, it might throw your model off but it's part of the system that you're modeling. So you wanna keep it in there. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Raj, is data augmentation something that is native to Data Robot, or do we need to do this ourselves outside of the platform? So for working with tabular data, Data Robot doesn't offer kind of any kind of data augmentation per se. What we do suggest, is using techniques um, like weights, where essentially it's you're telling the data robot to give more weight to specific rows, and that can be a, a useful technique for kind of adding more data to a given problem, but it's not creating synthetic data. That's right. Does that make sense, Dave? You want to explain that well enough? Yeah. It you know, this question kind of comes up and you know us internally like you know, is it okay to use smote and, and our, our our internal product team and our data science team really pushes back against it um just because of the underlying assumptions and synthetic data and generating synthetic data are are some really big assumptions that can throw things off yeah we need to do like a blog post just on that but thanks guys uh just a time check we have 10 more minutes and we have Great questions. So uh, we're going to get through as many as we can, and then uh, I'll let everybody know where you could uh, send out uh, your future questions that we could respond to them after uh, the learning session. Next question. So Dave, what about techniques for a time series when only the most recent data is now relevant? Yeah, so so you kind of you are a little bit stuck with time series because it likes to have a history to learn from. But there are a couple things you can do. So one, as I kind of mentioned, think about temporarily using non-time series regression to learn from any examples that could still be relevant and then test them on the most recent examples you have. You don't have enough history to really build out a true time series forecast, but you can still get an understanding from an ordinary regression model of what's going on in the present. Another technique is just to shorten up your time step so that Sure, you may only at this point have two weeks of data, but if we shorten up our time set to you know, daily data, or maybe even every half day data, well, now we do have enough to extrapolate some type of trend. You have to be careful doing that because when you shorten up your time step, you can introduce a lot more noise and variation to your time series forecast. But as a temporary fix, it may work. Yeah, I've seen a lot of our customers doing that in the short term with all the COVID-19. Yeah, and, and another thing is just to acknowledge that you know a longer forecast just isn't going to work as well. So maybe if you were forecasting months out, you know now things have suddenly changed. You can only really forecast a few weeks or maybe even a few days out. Just kind of working with a shorter forecast window for the time being. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question to both of you: Can we do a session on unbalanced data sets in the future? I think that's a great idea. So I don't know Perfect. if I'll recruit Dave or somebody else, but yes, I know I think that makes um, a total total sense. And so yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Next question: 
can you further explain the reshuffle of CV folds for wide data sets and how it works, Raj? The reshuffle of, okay, so, so one of the things is when you get to wide data sets, an important piece of that is doing some feature selection. Um, the advantage of a narrow data set is we can just kind of rerun it multiple times, but with a wide data set, you want to spend some time trying to reduce your features because if you only have a few rows, it's hard for a lot of those algorithms to take advantage of those features or know which of those features to use when building. Um, so this is where taking into account kind of, and, and Dave had the screen earlier, different feature selection techniques. So for example, being able to see which features are just even sl slightly correlated so you can go from let's say 10,000 features down to a thousand using the techniques like feature impact for example to identify which of the features are useful use recursive feature elimination to start bringing those down so that has to go hand in hand while you're doing that with rerunning it multiple times and so what happens is this can become really computationally complex and some of our customers that have really wide data sets with data robot literally for one project will build thousands of projects and each of those projects has hundreds of models and so the numbers grow quite a bit here but that's kind of sometimes the best way to tackle data sets that are both really short and wide thanks raj few more questions before we close it out. So Dave, uh, are there any special precautions for forecasting problems? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the biggest one is really, is my history that I'm extrapolating from relevant to what's happening now? So uh, thinking about you know seasonality that may have showed up over the past three years, does that seasonality still apply? For example, if I've got a retail model that's, you know, learned sales around Memorial Day because it's typically a big shopping day. A lot of folks, a lot of retailers have big blowout sales on Memorial Day. You're going to want to ask, well, do I actually expect that to happen in 2020 or are we still likely looking at closed stores? It's, it's one of those questions you have to be very careful with because, you know, there still is online retail. There still is retail happening and there's still likely to be sales on that day. So past examples of a bump from Memorial Day sales may still be relevant. But you've also got to understand that the behavior has probably changed quite a bit. So you want to be really careful using past year's examples um, to understand the present. Yeah, I mean, and it gets tricky nowadays because at the end of the day, uh, for some of these things, somebody has to lay out a number. Somebody has to figure out how many to stock, how many to order like that. Um, so. You know, I've had many customers pulling out their hair, trying to figure out what they're doing, um, trying to use proxies from past incidents to kind of use insights in combination with wisdom from subject matter experts in the short term until there is enough data to kind of build good models. And the other related piece I want to kind of always note here is when we have small data, sometimes as we talked about, the information density kind of differs where a simple model works really well, other times it doesn't. And so when we talk about modeling and trying different approaches, sometimes the person who builds the model in Excel with a simple linear regression, that works just fine. The problem is simple and that works. So the key is, is, is to think about and to consider that sometimes these problems can be really simple, or on the other hand, they can be really noisy and very difficult to solve, even with the fanciest advanced machine learning techniques as well. Um, and so you got to kind of know what space you're in when you're working with a problem. And I mean, this brings up a whole kind of how to set up the problem and how to start working on these problems. But I just want to kind of let people know that there's a couple sides of this. Sometimes things are easy. Sometimes they're really difficult. Thanks, Raj. It looks like we'll have time for one more. So this will be the last one. This is in regards to wide but short data sets. How do you know which are irrelevant features? In other words, how do you know which features to dump before modeling? So, so two easy ways that I, I often do is, one is within Data Robot, we have something called the A score, which is essentially, you can think of it conceptually as how correlated a feature is to the target. So what's the relationship between a given variable to what you're trying to model? And one, one way to kind of just limit the feature set size is just throw out things that don't seem to have a relationship to it. 
And this is how I go sometimes from 10,000 down to 1,000. Now, once you're at 1,000, this is where you can use build a model, find out what the feature impact is, use the techniques like permutation importance, see which of the variables are important. And then because you know that model is only going to see a limited part of the data, a partial piece, because you have a small data set, you actually build multiple models. And I didn't, I don't think he showed one of the slides of that day, day, but sometimes one of the things we often encourage people to do as a technique is to aggregate feature impact, for example, across multiple models. So I can see not only what is the most important feature in one particular run of the model, but across multiple runs. And by doing that over many models, we can start identifying what are the features that consistently go to the top of the pile? Which are the ones that are always at the bottom of the pile? And use that as a feature selection technique. So I think feature selection is a whole nother um, topic that we could probably spend an hour um, talking about. Thanks, Raj. And uh, we'll close out here. So David, if you could go to the final slide. Awesome. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining today and especially thank Raj and Dave for their time to go through this uh, awesome learning session. So as mentioned previously, you can reference this session, previous ones, and register for future sessions at community.datarobot.com. Uh, we are constantly updating with new topics and we'll uh, also take in suggestions. So like we'll definitely take in the suggestion of unbalanced data sets and add that as a future topic. Um, also, keep in mind, you'll receive communications around upcoming sessions as well. <clears throat> I also want to mention it. Also, this is also a learning center where you can collaborate and share ideas with your fellow peers and customers and data robot experts and learn how to become an expert yourself within uh, this platform. And as mentioned before, uh, for, an, for any additional questions and the ones that we didn't get to, please feel free to email us at AI Success hyphen webinars at datarobot.com. And again, thank you for joining today's learning session and looking forward to seeing all of you at the next one. Have a great day.